All right, so next we have uh, Matt Domier and we're gonna do uh, building APWPs from v VGPs. Thank you. Where's the pointer? Ah, oh, just here. Hello. So as you can see from my title, Dowie just gave this talk. Um, so I can make this relatively brief. So um, there is a, a subtle, but I hope important distinction in this talk relative to what he just told you. And that is, we're gonna be exploring working from the real site level data as opposed to the simulated site level data. And I hope to convince you over the course of the next half hour or so that there's good reason for doing that, even though it's quite a bit more work. Um, and just because there's necessarily gonna be a bit of repetition here, I can give you the punchline right away. You can take a power nap and wake up at a conclusion slide, clap, or maybe not, depends on how this goes. Um, but I would say that the framework that Dowie just presented is certainly the way forward in the short to intermediate term, but I think it's well worth the extra effort um, to work with the real site level data. And to, to Lisa's point, we could extend that uh, very easily to the sample or measurement level if we have access to the original data that will allow us to do that. So that's kind of the message here as well. And this is obviously very, um, this is the right place to, I hope, sell this message because magic is really the only facility at the moment that would potentially allow us to do exactly that. Okay, so I have a long list of, of co-authors here. Um, some of them are in this room, so you can also hold them accountable if you think this is madness. And I would also just like to highlight the fact that I'm not at the head of the co-author train. That's actual, actually Leandro Gajo, who is a Mary Curie fellow at the University of Oslo. And he uh, did the bulk of, the, of the, the heavy lifting here. So he should be rightly recognized as uh, leading the, the train. Okay, so this project uh, grew out of a workshop that was held in November of 2021 in the small town outside of Oslo, where we stuffed all the people from the first slide into a, a tiny house on the Oslo Fjord in the Norwegian winter. So here's like the two hours of daylight that we had, which is great for getting people to do science. And the, the theme of the workshop uh, you can see here is frontiers in quantitative paleogeography and paleomagnetism. And the idea was just to get together uh, a bunch of people in related fields, um, which all broadly have interests in, in paleogeography and to brainstorm, try to think about how we could push on the frontiers of quantitative paleogeography, and in particular, the application of paleomagnetism to paleogeographic problems. So I wanted to actually talk a bit about the backstory um, that led up to why we decided to focus on a parent polar wonder path construction. And that involves paleomagnetic Euler pole analysis, which I'm really excited about, but it, I was going to spend way too much time on that. So that uh, became a rabbit hole that I have to avoid, but I would love to talk about that later for anyone who cares um, to chat about it. Um, but to make a long story short, then uh, paleomagnetic Euler pole analysis or PEP analysis, um, it's had a long history. Uh, so oftentimes paleomagnetism is, is kind of accused of being some weird form of magic by people outside of our community, in which case PEP analysis is like the blackest of magic. So there's lots of potential issues, or there are lots of issues with PEP analysis, but I think several of those have been overcome in the last years. Some of those problems have been overcome in the last years. Um, but one of the things that's not yet resolved is, is when PEP can work, or if we're actually able to build a parent polar wonder pass, which are suitable for PEP um, to, to operate, because we need to have extremely high resolution a parent polar wonder pass for PEP to work. So that led us to talk about uh, a parent polar wonder pass construction methods at the, at the workshop. And I, I took a few questions or distilled a few questions uh, out of the brainstorming session that we had at this workshop, which I think are particularly motivating and which led to uh, the work that I'm going to show you in the next few slides. So first of all, we, we know, uh, especially just because Dowie told us that the uncertainties are not being handled properly when we're constructing a parent polar wonder pass, right? We're dropping them all over the place. So if we were able to put on some special glasses, some magic glasses that allowed us to see the real uncertainties, what would they actually look like? Would they be huge? Would they actually be circularly symmetric about the mean pole positions? Uh, how would they look? What resolution could an apparent polar wonder pass actually hypothetically reach. So we know that secular variation is obviously imposing some ultimate limit. What is that limit in space and time? We don't really know that. And I think uh, the most motivating question of all on this slide is actually, what should an apparent polar wonder path even look like? So this is actually one of 
Brahms questions from the workshop that I really like. So there's kind of two n-member models. So in a pure, perfect PEP world, an apparent polar wonder path should be a discrete series of small circle segments separated by very sharp cusps. But in the other n-member world, and in that world, you would have stable Euler poles uh, in the paleomagnetic, paleomagnetic reference frame for some geologically meaningful period of time. And then suddenly the, the position of that Euler pole would switch. The other end member is that apparent polar wonder pass would be continuously curved, which would tell us that true polar wonder is oftentimes imposing a significant sing signal on top of the, um, the Euler poles, which are uh, describing relative plate motions or absolute plate motions. Okay, so we don't even know actually what the apparent polar wonder paths that we're building should even look like. So this is kind of a motivating question in and of itself because it has implications for geodynamics. Okay, so I have to set up uh, the conventional approach. I mean, I'm sure everyone in the room knows how this works, but uh, just for the sake of completeness, I thought we could go through this very quickly together. And then I'll highlight some of the shortcomings of the conventional approach and what our VGP-based approach can do about that. Okay, so let's say we want to build a new apparent polar wonder path. The first thing we have to do is, is actually construct a new set of paleopoles. So the conventional way of working is we go out, we identify some formation that we want to work on, that's the right age. We collect a series of paleomagnetic sites. These should be distributed in time, as we've heard several times in the last days. They could also be distributed in space, but they have to be distributed in time. And any given site uh, may have a number of samples. Of course, this is also an interesting question. How many samples should any given site actually have? And if the rocks are well behaved, we may even be able to slice several specimens from those samples. Then we go into the lab make measurements of the specimens and the samples. And then we want to condense this information into something that's readily communicable. So we start averaging back up the chain, right? So we're, if we have multiple specimens, we may average them together to give rise to a, to a sample mean. In many cases, we just pick our favorite one. When we arrive to the sample level, we compute the Fisher average um, and to compute a, a site level mean direction. At this point, the modern way of working is we apply this direction to pole space transformation to move from a site level mean to a site level virtual geomagnetic pole. And then again, we take the Fisher mean uh, of these site level VGPs to arrive to our study level Kelly pole. It's worth um, just in passing mentioning that in the, in the older world, we actually made this direction to pole space transformation at the next level up. Um, so computing a, a, a study level mean direction and then casting that into whole space. And there's a logic behind each one of these averaging steps, at least philosophically. So at, at the base here, we assume that um, the differences between specimens and samples is just dictated by the presence of random errors. So between specimens, for example, we could have measurement errors. Between samples, we may have orientation errors. When we get to the site level, in the ideal case, we assume that all the dispersion is due to secular variation, and that by averaging these VGPs, we arrive to a, 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 an ideal record of the time average uh, dipolar field. Okay, so then we have a one paleopole. We can then pour through the literature um, looking for other paleopoles from the same block. We may, may also rotate additional data, additional paleopoles from some other block using plate circuits. And we have this collection of paleopoles distributed in time. And now we want to build an apparent polar wonder path from that. So we could either pass a spherical spline to this data, but the way that the community tends to prefer to work is applying a moving average window, in which case we bin together a collection of poles of similar age and compute uh, the mean, the Fisher mean of that collection, right? So now we have an apparent polar wonder path is showing us the, the apparent motion of the uh, of the geomagnetic pole from the perspective of some stationary continent. Okay, so there's a number of significant shortcomings with this approach, some of which Dawe already touched upon, which I'll now repeat. Uh, so first of all, we're we're introducing an artificial hierarchical level. So Dawe talked quite a bit about this. These are namely the paleopoles. Uncertainties are not propagated either in space or in time. We're also assuming parametric distributions every step of the way, right? When we're describing the uncertainty. So this is um, something that Dowie was exploiting in, in his uh, talk or in the framework that he's presenting. I'm gonna point out some situations where this might actually be a bad idea. Um, and then 
it, we're oftentimes also working with a, a collection of data which is heterogeneous in the sense that it's been processed in different ways. And this is not an easy problem to tackle when you're working at the level of study level polls. So I'm going to step through these one by one uh, and point out uh, what we can do about some of these things. Um, and this has also been written up now in a paper that was just submitted last week. So undoubtedly, some of you have gotten this in your inbox for review, so you can just take it up with me now, um, if that's the case. Um, yeah. Okay, so number one, the introduction of an artificial hierarchical level. So again, there's, there's a reason, a rationale, a logic behind each one of these averaging steps. But what is happening when we're moving from the study level paleopole level to the mean pole level, right? So this is what Nick was just pointing out. What is the what is the philosophical basis for this averaging? So Dowie has before called this the averaging of averages. I really like a phrasing from a paper by Euron Euron Haldenfa and uh, Eric Tilver from a couple of years ago, where they said that this averaging step has no clear phenomenological basis. Right? What are we averaging out when we're averaging study level paleopoles, especially if they're the same age? Right? We've already moved from BGPs to a time average field. Why would we be averaging multiple time average fields that are the same age? That doesn't make much sense. So in addition to just being kind of strange philosophically, this also has practical implications. So these panels you've already seen from Dawei's talk, but I'll just repeat it because I think it's really important. So one problem with averaging uh, paleopoles, or first averaging from BGPs to paleopoles and then paleopoles to a mean pole, is we're completely perturbing, disturbing, perverting the distribution of data that we're actually trying to describe, right? We want to describe the position of, of the time averaged geomagnetic field uh, as you could average it from a collection of data representing secular variation. If we first take the VGPs and we average them to paleopoles, right, and, the, and the, the collection of VGPs in any given paleopole is arbitrary, we're going to be we're going to be suppressing n, and we're elevating k, right? So the the distribution of red dots doesn't look much like the distribution of black dots. So the result that we're going to compute our mean pole is not going to be reflecting the underlying scatter of the real secular variation that we're trying to get rid of, right? So that's one problem. And another problem also covered by Dowie is the fact that by the very nature of averaging different amounts of information, different numbers of EGPs, in the end, if we treat all of these with equal weight, we're gonna be biasing the mean towards those data with the least information content, right? So there's gonna be uh, paleopoles with relatively few EGPs, which also happen to be the least precise, which are gonna be biasing our mean result. So, uh, what can we do about this? Stop using paleopoles, right? Why bother with this artificial hierarchical level? So we can, of course, fix the problem by weighting the paleopoles, but then why would we why would we even do that to begin with? Right? You can just avoid the whole problem by working with VGPs directly. Okay. Second issue: uncertainties are not propagated. So uh, Dawei already talked about this, of course. A perfect example of this is that we're looking at the A95 here on this mean pole position. This is only reflecting the uncertainty in the position of these means of the underlying study level paleopoles, not their constituent uncertainties, their constituent spatial uncertainties, right? That's not being propagated uh, into the mean uh, estimate. So this can be done. We can propagate these uncertainties numerically. So this has been done uh, by Hans Tover in 2020. In this case, they were working with the, the actual VGPs as well. In the case of what Dawi just showed you, they're resampling by Monte Carlo resampling, um, a Monte Carlo approach. They're resampling from the uncertainties, the parametric uncertainties applied to the study level pulse. All right, but in both cases, both what Hansman and Tover did and what, what Dawi and Brahm had done is propagating uncertainties from the study level paleo poles up into the apparent polar wonder path. But we actually have uncertainties all the way through this hierarchical chain going into the basement, right? So what about all of these other uncertainties? So these can also, or these should be propagated upwards. So there's actually some really interesting and quite complementary work that has been done by David Hesloff and, and Andrew Roberts in a couple of papers that I don't have time to go into the details of, but they're putting together some very interesting um, techniques where they're able to propagate analytically 
uh, the uncertainties upwards from the measurement level uh, up to the, the site level, and then again from the study level into the apparent polar wander path. But there's a brick wall in between or a razor wire fence, which is this direction to pole space transformation, which completely mucks up uh, the capacity to analytically propagate fissure uncertainties upwards. So uh, what are we gonna do about this? Well, there's no reason why we can't continue to numerically propagate in the same way that Hansman and Tilbert have from the study level all the way through this hierarchical network, right? Okay, so uncertainties can be numerically propagated, bootstrapped from any hierarchical level, at least in principle. Uh, so that was, that was in space. Uncertainties are not propagated in space, but they're actually not propagated in time in the conventional approach either. We, we just take the nominal age of any given paleopole and we forget about the temporal uncertainties. So that means that if this particular paleopole actually has an age uncertainty which bleeds into one of these neighboring windows, in the conventional approach, we don't, we don't think about that. that. That pole doesn't make an appearance in these neighboring windows. But this is also something we can deal with numerically. Uh, again, uh, Dawei talked about this. Uh, here's some even earlier work from uh, Nick's group. And in this case, they're just comparing a set of, of paleopoles in order to infer the latitudinal uh, drift rate of, of Laurentia. But here they're um, drawing by Monte Carlo approaches, both from the temporal and spatial uncertainties on a pair of poles in order to infer uh, not only the, the, the the rate of drift, but also what are the uncertainties on that rate of drift. So we can do the same thing uh, with our apparent polar wander paths. Temporal uncertainties can also be propagated via bootstrap and also from any lower hierarchical level. So this might strike you as a bit odd. Why are we talking about lower hierarchical levels when it comes to age information? This is something I'm gonna come back to in a, in a couple of slides. Okay, the next problem, we're assuming parametric distributions every step of the way. So I should say that um, as a self-respecting paleomagnetist, I obviously can't say a bad word about the Fisher distribution. I love the Fisher distribution, right? Everyone here loves the Fisher distribution. But the reality is that even though we're invoking it every step of the way in the conventional approach, not all directional data sets are Fisher distributed. So this is actually a panel from one of the papers of um, Haslop and Roberts that I showed on a, a previous slide. So here we can very nicely see their analytical propagation scheme at work. So the, the squares here are study level paleopoles. I can't remember exactly what the, the age range was. Um, and the, the red dot here is the mean, uh, the mean pole position you would compute from them. And the solid red circle around it is the conventional A95, right? The red dash line is their uh, version of the A95 with the uncertainties being fully propagated from the study level poles. So you can see already how much larger that uncertainty is when you're propagating the uncertainties from the constituent study level poles. But look at the distribution of poles in this case. It's highly elongated, right? So this is probably not, and this is not in any way to, to minimize what Heslov and Roberts have done. And in their paper, they rightly point out that this data set is probably not the best one to be working with. Um, but this is a good indication of, uh, of the fact that uh, these parametric uncertainties are not always a good starting point, right? So this is at the study level paleopole level, but we also have uh, many examples of data which are not Fisher distributed also at the, uh, the next hierarchical level below. So this is a collection of VGPs um, for which the paleopole makes an appearance in the, the Taurus Fake 2012 apparent polar wonder path. I think it's also in uh, the vase at all global apparent polar wonder path. And there's nothing wrong with this data, but it's, it's not Fisher distributed, right? So we shouldn't be using a Fisher, dis, uh, Fisher distribution to describe uh, the uncertainties associated with it. Okay, so how do we get around this problem? Again, we can work with bootstraps, in this case, non-parametric bootstraps from uh, lower hierarchical levels to avoid parametric assumptions, in this case, in the study level, but you could also push this into lower hierarchical levels by working with data, which are even further down. All right, so that was in space, but this is actually also true in time. So uh, let's say for the sake of argument, we have a collection of, of data, a collection of sites, which are nicely distributed uh, stratigraphically. And we know perfectly well the age at the base and the age at the top of this stratigraphic sequence. So in the conventional way of working, 
we compute the mean age, this black dot, and we just assign that to all of these sites, right? They're all exactly the same age in the conventional approach to, to working with paleomagnetic data and building a parent polar wonder paths. So we know that's not, that's not a great idea. A better way of working is we can assign some uncertainty to that age assignment, and we could use a uniform uh, distribution in this case. And we could randomly draw from that uniform distribution and assign it to these different sites, right? So this is what was done by Hansman and Tover. This is also effectively what's, what's done in the base of all approach. But in that particular case, you could end up with a random age draw where this is the oldest and this is the youngest site, right? And that doesn't make a lot of sense. So a better way of working would actually be to incorporate this stratigraphic information. We know the relative ordering of these things. In another example, our data might be, might be distributed or our sites might be distributed like this, where again, a uniform distribution here is maybe not the best assumption, right? Because all the sites are concentrated towards the top. So we can, do, uh, we can do better in the sense of freeing our sites from study level parametric um, uncertainties or distributions. So for here, for example, we could do some interesting things with a probabilistic age assignments where we're incorporating information about the relative ordering of things. You could also even incorporate information about sedimentation rates. And the same is also true for um, uh, igneous rocks. So in the, the compilation of data that I'll show you uh, in a few slides, it's actually amazing to me how many uh, data sets there are where you have let's say 30, 40 lavas, 30, 40 sites, and each one of them is directly isotopically dated. So we have a direct age date from every lava. And in the end, we calculate a weighted mean age and collapse all of that beautiful information into one single number. So in the conventional approach, you just take this black line, right? You have this beautiful array of age information between all these different sites. We compute a weighted mean age and we just take this nominal mean value and throw away all the other information. So a better way of working again is to adopt some uncertainty um, and propagate that into our, our, our workflow. And in that case, we're still imposing one single set of uh, uncertainty information on all these sites when we can otherwise directly tap into this much richer set of information associated with each one of those sites. So we can bootstrap site level data to avoid imposing a study level parametric uh, uh, distribution on the age uncertainties. Okay, so the final problem is that the underlying data when we're building parent pull the wonder pass are invariably heterogeneous in the way that they've been constructed, right? Because we're using, the community has never been able to agree upon a common recipe for how we filter data, right? So Dawei also talked about this, so the number of samples per site, how big should the alpha 95 on a given site be allowed, or how large of an alpha 95 should we allow uh, in any given site? How large can the angle from, uh, from the mean be before we toss it out or label it as transitional and, and, and kill it? So in the end, we're working with apples and oranges and bananas and strawberries and lots of other fruits because the way that we filtered our data is invariably very, very different from one study to the next. So if we're working with the original site level data, we can actually retroactively apply the same filter so we can homogenize our data treatments across the entire collection. Okay, so um, I'm now gonna talk a little bit about the framework that we constructed to do this, but in order for us to be able to operate on something, we had to build a new compilation. So we, in the beginning, uh, thought about trying to use the, the magic database, but it turned out that it didn't at the moment have uh, all the stuff that we needed. So this is something that I'm interested in further discussing is how we could incorporate some of the extra uh, metadata columns that we, in the end, uh, needed, how this could be incorporated into the magic database. So we built our own compilation, which took uh, quite a lot of time. So we have almost 2,000 site-level records from 40 studies from Cenozoic North America. Each one of those records has its own age and age of certainty assigned to it. The stratigraphic ordering where we know it is logged. It's a comprehensive set of metadata associated with each one of those records. We also retrieve rejected data and we tag them with the reason for their dismissal. So again, we can retroactively homogenize our data treatment across the entire collection. Repeated instances of the same 
uh, site or log. So for example, the Bishop top has been sampled a billion times. So we wanna make sure that we're not over-representing um, single cooling units. And the entire compilation now is, is ported into magic uh, thanks to some magic tricks pun intended by, by Nick and Yiming. So Anik Vanderbone, who's also a, a co-author in this work, has assured me that all presentations are made better with a gift. So that's ticked off. Okay, so this is what the data set looks like. So um, as a starting point, we decided to work with the authors, the original authors selection of data. So I, I said before that the idea is to be able to homogenize retroactively the data set. So we're interested in doing that, but just as a first pass, we decided to default to the author's original selections. And you can see that that actually has a rather profound effect. So half of the VGPs have been discarded. And again, we're in the future, we're uh, interested in exploring this homogeniz hom homogenization process and to see what different the data quality filters do in the end result. So this is uh, how the studies are distributed in space and how the, the site level VGPs are distributed in time. I'd like to call attention to the remarkable gap uh, in site level data between 10 and 20 MA. So this is something I'll try to remember to come back to uh, in a couple of slides. Okay, so this is one uh, busy slide that's just meant to communicate the essence of how this framework works. So the first thing we do is we take all of the site level data from all of the studies and it goes into a big bin or a big box. Then we draw them out one by one and we redraw a new direction and a new age from the uncertainties assigned in space and time to that particular site. So at this point, we're working parametrically because this is the base of our framework, right? So we're doing Monte Carlo resampling. And then we can take each direction and cast it to a VGP. So now we have a collection of randomly redrawn VGPs where the direction associated with that VGP and the age associated with that VGP are coming from the uncertainties at the site level. Then we can compute uh, a moving average apparent polar wonder path where we're using a, a weighted bootstrap where we're preferentially pulling in VGPs which are closest in age to the central age of the window. And, and that gives us one statistically plausible apparent polar wonder path. Now we can do that again and again and again and again. We can do that tens of thousands of times. And we arrive to an ensemble of statistically plausible apparent polar wonder paths on which we can do some statistics. Okay, so this was just to remind me to say that we, we can tick off many of those problems uh, that I raised before. So we're avoiding paleopoles. We've gotten rid of that arbitrary hier hierarchical level. We're able to uh, propagate uncertainties in space and time from the site level, but this is extensible to lower hierarchical levels if we have access to sample or measurement level data. We're avoiding parametric assumptions above the site level. Again, we still have to appeal to parametric assumptions be at the uh, at the level of the site itself because we're it's the lowest level from which we're working at the moment. But that can also be taken to look to uh, lower hierarchical levels if we have access to data from lower hierarchical levels. And in principle, this can be the data at the site level can be homogenized. All right. So this is the outcome of our uh, apparent polar wander path for North America for the last 60 million years. So this is in one million year increments and these are not interpolated poles. So it's not that we calculated the apparent polar wander path at 10 million year increments and then just stitched together a bunch of poles in between. Each one of these poles is directly computed from the VGP collection. So the first thing that I would like to call your attention to is just the fact that it's remarkably smooth despite the fact that we're working on such a high uh, temporal resolution. All of the little gray wispy hairs you can see in the background are individual runs, so individual iterations. And then these the colored circles, which are showing you the mean pole positions, are the principal component that we determine from that collection of mean poles of the same age. Uh, the panels on the right are showing you this apparent polar wander path decomposed into latitude, longitude, and apparent polar wander rate time series where the little blue dots are showing you again, the principal component of the age ensemble and the blue bands are showing you the empirical 95% confidence bounds. Uh, we still have to take some time to dwell into the details of exactly how robust all aspects of this path are. So I don't wanna to spend too much time um, trying to tease apart what could be happening uh, through the course of this 60 million year 
uh, apparent polar wander path. But I do want to draw your attention to the fact that for the last 30 million years, we see a very progressive uh, change in the latitude of the, of the pole position uh, to higher latitudes. But there's no change in the apparent polar wander rate, at least within uncertainty. So this is uh, distinct from the, what you would get from either of the other two approaches, so the conventional approach. So now I should first explain before I get ahead of myself here. What we're looking at now uh, are the three different approaches that I've talked about kind of laid out side by side. So in, in this case, we've computed the same path using the conventional approach on the same data set. So, so this is the same 60 million year uh, data compilation from North America, but here building the apparent polar wonder path in the conventional way. So working with paleo poles. In the middle, is the framework that Dawi just introduced, so working with pseudo VGPs, but again on the same data set. And on the right is what you get when you're working from the real site level data. So you can see already there's a dramatic improvement uh, in, in the path uh, if we use the approach that Dawi just introduced. But I would argue that we get an even more well resolved picture working with the direct site level data. And even though it's uh, not so clear to see, in the 10 to 20 million year, uh, window here, which is exactly where we have a dearth of data. The other two approaches give rise to an elevated rate of apparent polar wonder, which is probably not real. So Dawi pointed out that he's able to cut off several of the, the peaks in apparent polar wonder uh, that are present in the conventional approach by using the pseudo VGPs approach. The same is true moving from the pseudo VGPs approach to working with the real site level data. So um, this is now the abrupt end of our tour. Uh, so the take home message is that working directly from site level data avoids several important advantages and can yield apparent polar wonder pass with unprecedented, unprecedented resolution. But it's gonna take a huge effort on behalf of the whole community for us to get up and running, first of all, on the global scale, but even more so to go to even lower hierarchical levels. So obviously the magic database um, is really the only way that this would be possible. But in order for that to work, uh, this has to be a collective effort with people dumping data into the database. So please help us to build better apparent polar wonder paths. I guess I had the same question earlier about the ballot. So I can just talk to that. Uh, but, um, do, you, do you think the different VGPs should be weighted the same if they represent different amounts of finality? Because fundamentally, there, there, you know, the underlying variance between different VGPs are different varieties. Yeah, so I mean, in principle, each VGP is supposed to represent a spot rating, but that's in practice impossible because you have some, I mean, if you're measuring some bulk sample time is being integrated in there. Um, but I think that that's, that would be very difficult to, I mean, yes, I would agree in principle that you would, you would have, um, it would be useful to, to find some way to weight the VGPs, but I'm, I'm not sure that you would be able to very easily identify how much time is necessarily being integrated into any given reading. So that's a very time consuming process. So I think the, the shortcut of assuming that each VGP is a spot reading is, is probably a reasonable starting point. I'm not sure if that was an answer to your question. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking how like more extreme cases like, you know, talking about like the anarchocytes yesterday, right? Or the CRM, you know, it could be a very long time. So in those cases, I would say that's if that's not a spot reading. Then if it's, I mean, if you if you think it's averaging a huge amount of time, it's no longer a, a VGP. Then it's a yeah. time. Then it's a time averaged full. But so but but splitting hairs and saying this VGP is averaging one year and this VGP is averaging one point five years. That one's averaging five hundred yeah. years. So like for those non VGP people, yeah. So it, how would it be? So if it's a time averaged whole, I then it wouldn't be incorporated into this analysis because you have already averaged secular variation out. So I think that was a lovely presentation. Um, everything that you have done here, of course, relies critically on the assessment of uncertainties in the original observations. 
which is a sort of wake up call to the community of life. And it's not enough just to uh, say that I've got a high cap a year and you should consider that reliable. Um, and the other question that I have is in your region where you have so few data, mm. um, it's sort of surprising that your uncertainty as your confidence intervals don't blow up more. And that seems to me that that's a consequence of the fact that when you're doing your sampling, your resampling, you just don't have a representative distribution. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not sure if I entirely un understood what you were asking, but so there is an issue, of course, with that window of time where we have few data, but this approach is improving upon the previous, because the pre previous approaches would basically just grab a hole on the one side and a bunch of data on the other. In our case, there's actually a few VGPs which span that gap. So because we're preferentially sampling the VGPs which are closest to the mean age of the window, we're actually grabbing the same VGPs over and over again which isn't great, but it's a better approach than just grabbing the data on either side, which are, of course, going to give rise to a very artificial um, estimate of a parent polar wander in between. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just saying that I think that when you grab those EGPs over and over again, you're giving an artificial level of um, accuracy to a relatively small yes. number of yes. Yes. It's sort of what I mean what happens in many things where yeah. you lack like spatial and temporal distribution, you just end up with something that is very dependent on a small number of locations. Yes, I agree completely. So that's one thing we've talked about is how we could actually and this is why I don't want to spend too much time digging into exactly what's going on with that apparent polar wonder path, because we still have to test um, to see which parts are really robust. So one thing we could do is just go through and see how many VGPs are actually contributing to any given estimate. And if there's some very low number, then we just ignore poles from that particular age, in which case we wouldn't have a you know an apparent polar wander path that's necessarily a one million year increments, but it would at least be at the places where we are trusting that the data are reliable and there would be an emission of a particular pole where there's not enough VGPs for us to presently actually derive some estimate that we can trust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just one piece of commentary on that, which I think is exciting about both of these talks, and like Rob or in his paper and Leandro in his paper too, um, is that for, despite the prevailing opinion that uh, there's there's sort of uh, sufficient data from stable continental interiors that such data sets are still hard to scare. I mean, that's, that's a fact that like, that case for the biases for North America is a bit of a striking example of that. And I think you lose that when you're in this running mean. Uh, at the whole level of uh, yeah, framework. So I think that's both that sort of mo motivating. Uh, yeah, so both of the approaches that we've just seen kind of involve uh, bootstrap resampling the data down to the level that you have them. Yeah. And at that point, just sampling from a distribution where you don't. Do you think it's possible to kind of ameliorate these by basically where you have the data bootstrapping it and where you don't resample it from a distribution at every level? Uh, you know. But I'm not sure that uh, if I understood correctly. So it, um, for it, so in, in Dawei's uh, framework or the VASE at all framework, they're resampling from the study level paleopoles because they don't have any information from below that. So you can resample parametrically at that level, but you don't have access to anything to derive. I mean, you can assume some static number of samples in, in every site, but I'm not sure that that would necessarily better inform, you know, the the outcome. Yeah, but, uh, right. So we're forced to parametrically sample from whichever level we're standing on, but everything above that we can work non-parametrically by just bootstrap resampling um, upwards. I guess you could assume some sort of like prior to the stuff that you don't have data, but then I guess. Uh, yeah, but yeah, so but the problem is between sites, the number of samples is going to change, the precision parameter is going to change. And so those things you can't, I mean, you could assume some static values across the entire collection, but I'm not sure that that would improve the outcome. Yeah. Um, what were the uncertainties in the apparent order map? Were those original samples or? This here? That's, that's a great question. So this is a discussion that, um, so we just submitted this paper last week and we're still trying to figure out how best to actually report 
the uncertainties in the end because we're working non-parametrically. So of course, at the end, we end up with this hideous uh, set of, um, well, I mean, so here we can, we can try to show the uncertainties in latitude and longitude space by just um, showing that this 95% confidence, the empirical 95% confidence interval. But doing this on the sphere is more complicated, of course, because you either have to then assume some parametric um, distribution in order to report something simple, or you have to do something really nasty with like kernel um, density estimates. So th this isn't something we have yet resolved. So one option is just to provide some simple parametric uh, uncertainty estimates at the end, either using a, a Fisher distribution or a Kent distribution if we determine that some of them are elongate. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answered your question either, but. Oh, I, I'm just curious if they were actually the small circles. Yeah, so no, so the small circles are just, the, just showing you where the, um, the principal component lives, but the gray lines in the back give you kind of an idea of the spread of individual iterations. So the other thing which you don't know is the shape of the apparent or under path. Yeah. Um, it looks very much like a kind of a mini polar pole path. Yes. What are the costs mean? Yeah, so that's what I'm super excited about. But again, we haven't taken the time. So what, one thing we haven't done is, is considering what happens when you start throwing out individual studies, because some of the studies have a large number of VGPs. Um, so we have to take the time to really prove to ourselves that all of these segments are reproducible before we start doing that. But yes, that, that's, I mean, the first time that we saw this come up, we were all very excited about the capacity to fit um, small circle segments to each one of those three otherwise distinct looking sections. But it's saying that plot at that 30, 40 degree interval, it's only like two degrees, right? Um, yeah. Which is, anyway, like, I, like, I think your statement like, definitely holds for the zero to 30 part, the zero to 30 part of it. And that structure might very well be real uh, in that in that part of the little 330 MA. But if so, that sort of amazing must be be resolved. Yeah. So I have a question. It's kind of common enough. It seems like we would benefit from having a measurement of the data as like we've been talking about. You propagate everything up from level four and zero level. Um uh but we it's impossible to cover those for labs. Because whoever generated is dead. It was on the floppy disk, it no longer exists. Something so, how do we move forward as a community? Um, do we go back and generate these things? No, one thing that I think it would be interesting to try is to kind of mix and match these two approaches. So, Dow, the, the base at all approach is obviously, um, I think, the best we can do when we don't have access to lower level data. But you could imagine that wherever we have access to measurement level data, we can propagate the uncertainties all the way up the chain. Where we don't, we can try to simulate data as far down as we're able to get. So I, I think that's the, the best way forward. And then from, from this point on, we should always have all new studies have to report data down to the whatever sample or measurement level. So we can start working purely in this framework. But for, for legacy data, I think that the, the best we can do is to kind of fuse these two frameworks together. Okay. I mean, an interesting thing which connects to, uh, yeah, Francis, that always pointed to that N equals one on a, on a site, and you would actually skip out a hierarchy because you wouldn't, there wouldn't be a turn B. You would just be like, if you measure one specimen per site, it would be straight a specimen to, to, to EVP, right? So um, you have to improve the answer. But you, but you don't have an estimate of it because N equals one. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just in the in your the attitude for n equals one, right? And you sort of did this nice demonstration of that to give you the same answer. Um, you don't in this uncertainty propagation scheme, right? You wouldn't you don't have an estimate for that site level uncertainty, right? You have an estimate for how you resolve that question. I'm not arguing that what you're doing, like there's a lot of sense to it, like. And given that the largest source of scatter is that second information curve, rather than it with insight measurement slash orientation on the I don't think that that is the case. When, the, the reason why there isn't an insight scatter is because of, let's say, orientation. 
Whereas orientation errors, you will also have if you take the hundred five to nine o'clock, but you propagate them together. You, you can you cannot separate. If you want to know P is B, you gotta know what it is so that you can get rid of it. But for a poll, you just you average that same uncertainty, but now you do it over hundred individual sites rather than per site. So I don't think as long as you take the uncertainty into account as a measure, you measure it. Uh, so the the analysis of MEB. You take that into account with 100 sites, and you will automatically have a cost your orientation. You don't need to do that something. But I think your experiment shows, too, in terms of dropping the number of uh, samples down to one and it not affecting the result, um, given that it's not the really put together, that this might happen in terms of that measurement level, too, as long as the component is easily resolved. Yeah, well, it needed the real difference in one of the four days. In all, that was a uh, Fermi Supercron data set. And for some odd reason, the within size scatter is high for a lot of us. And the between size scatter is really low. And normally that's the other way around. But that is apparently the case. I don't know. And there it really made a difference for the estimate of the data we see by the average. But in the end, I think for, for overall for polls, you average the two things anyway. And you end up with a poll that could for polls with an high end. And even if you throw in 30% of the junk, it doesn't Yeah, I mean, well, it depends what you care about. If you care about the mean, that's true. If you care about the distribution, yeah, or the yeah, scatter, no, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I think there was a good back-to-back -back talk there. Uh, we'll have a copy break.